Kubrick always wanted to make a stylized film about basically war, not necessarily the Vietnam War, but the phenomena of war. I think what he was very interested in doing was watching the transmutation of young men into killers, exploring the metamorphosis that occurs when you take young people and, in effect, brutalize them and inure them to a sense of right and wrong. Kubrick always looked for short form material that he could adapt, and he'd read about Gustav Hasford's The Short Timers in 79 in a publication called Kirkus Reviews. The reason he liked it was because it had humor, it was, it was full of craziness, and it was totally off the wall. And that's what Stanley always liked, surprises and off the wall things. The problem was, by the time he thought of making a film about the Vietnam War, which would have been around 79, all of a sudden, Apocalypse Now appeared. I don't believe that Kubrick was ever influenced very much by outside events. Um, his tendency was to let other people do the thing, and then he would come in and do the great one. Uh, he did that with Vietnam. He let everybody else do their Vietnam film, then he comes in with Full Metal Jacket. He contacted Michael Herr, who wrote um, a lot of Martin Sheen's dialogue for Apocalypse Now. Michael Herr was a great expert. He, did, he wrote this book, Dispatches. So he was a top authority on that period. They undertook what Herr has described as one phone call lasting three years with interruptions. And Herr would turn out draft after draft of the screenplay. So the buzz was in Hollywood. Stanley Kubrick's making a Vietnam movie. Well, you got to get in that movie. Mr. Kubrick at that point was putting out his message that he was willing to look at anybody's audition tapes. So you had every actor in the world making these audition tapes and sending them off. Private Joker, are you trying to offend me? Sir, negative, sir! Sir, the private believes that any answer he gives will be wrong, and the senior drill instructor will beat him harder if he reverses himself, sir! Matthew Modine was shooting Birdie at the time that Kubrick first expressed an interest in him. And Alan Parker sent Kubrick some taped material of Matthew Modine doing his actorly bit, being the most birdie that he could be, thinking that this is how Stanley would see what Matthew Modine was capable of doing as an actor. But Stanley was looking for something different. And it was only because there was a little bit of extra tape at the end where you just saw Matthew Modine not speaking, not acting, but just kind of being, that gave Kubrick the idea that he wanted Matthew Modine in his film. He's a very good actor. At that time, he wasn't yet a superstar, but he had all the qualities to be one. I wanted to meet interesting and stimulating people of an ancient culture and kill them. I wanted to be the first kid on my block to get a confirmed kill. He was incredibly talented. He reminded me of a, a Jimmy Stewart. Very easygoing actor, very simple, and electrifying on screen. Right shoulder! Oh, huh. Matthew was actually also instrumental in getting Vincent D'Onofrio, who had no film experience at the time. Um, Matthew and Vince had been friends since they appeared on stage together. I was working at the front door of the Hard Rock Cafe as a bouncer, and Matthew and his wife walked by, and I said, hey, man, where have you been? And he said he's doing this Kubrick thing, and, and that there was a part available. Hi, Joker. I didn't even think about being in film. I, I saw a lot of films, but I saw film actors as being very different people than myself. Clearly, he was a talented young actor. It has been proven because he made a big career since then. A talented young actor who was flexible and also was willing to put on the weight. He asked me early on, would I be all right with gaining this weight? And, you know, I said yes. And then I went over there and I gained about 30 pounds. And, and I remember him seeing it and saying that I only looked like I could kick everybody's ass. So he thought some more weight would be needed. And I think it went up to 80 pounds. I think I went from 2 to 280. You cannot do one single pull up. 
You are a worthless piece of shit, pal! Now the problem is, when you bulk up for a Stanley Kubrick movie, you have to stay bulked up for God knows how long. You know, you don't know how long the shoot's gonna last. And I think that probably took its toll on Vince's body. The fucking war will be over by the time we get up there and in private pile! People treat you differently when you're that size. And you know, you gotta remember, I, my head was shaved. So it was like a completely different persona from the, being this like long, lanky actor to a big, burly guy with a bald head. You know, it was a very strange life change. As far as I'm concerned, Vince turned out to be the best part of the film. Left shoulder! <laughs> right shoulder! <laughs> I'm not a uh, military type. I'm not um, turned on by it. I don't like guns. This is my rifle! There are many like it, but this one is mine! I'm an actor, and I know how to take apart an M16 and put it back together blindfolded. Stanley made my career, there's no question to that. No question. I've done over 50 films because of him. Because of that part, because Stanley cast me. There is no other reason why I'm working. Easy, let it. Go easy, man. No! God was here before the Marine Corps. So you can give your heart to Jesus. But your ass belongs to the Corps. Do you ladies understand? Sir, yes, sir! We needed an advisor who, who told us exactly how the details work. For example, the movements that they do with the guns. A normal person doesn't know this. So we called an office in the United States that represents ex-Marines. And we asked for a drill instructor. Well, I found myself retired out of the Marine Corps uh, back in 1971, and I, I thought, well, I had no proper education, so really not much to fall back on. Got a phone call from Stanley Kubrick out of the clear blue one evening, and we talked about a full metal jacket, and he hired me as technical advisor. Because I am hard, you will not like me, but the more you hate me, the more you will learn. Our technical advisor comes in, and he starts yelling at us. I'm the boss, and this is that, and you're going to do this, and you're a piece of shit. We're like, whoa, who's this guy? This is your technical advisor. This is Lee Ermey. He's going to teach you how to shoot. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Lee Ermey was a drill sergeant, and he brought him in to drill the actors into a platoon and, and made them really work very hard. I think they got extremely fit on that film, the actors. Ten fucking seconds. It should take you no less than ten fucking seconds to negotiate this obstacle. We just uh, learned how to march like soldiers. I mean, there are scenes in that thing where it is us and it is for real and we look tight. We observed something very, very strange, namely that he then uh, went to wardrobe and put on a drill instructor's uniform. And he, in a way, fell back in his role. He wore the uniform and he changed his persona. He was a very nice man. And when he wore the uniform, he was a devil. I mean, he was a drill instructor, suddenly. I told Stanley that I would like to do Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, and he told me that he already had hired an actor. There was another guy who became the door gunner, Tim Colseri, who had the role. Hey, hey, get some, baby! And Lee took it from him. I interviewed all the background extras, and I interviewed these people as Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, knowing that that has to go to Stanley Kubrick. I worked it out where Stanley had to watch me be his drill instructor, whether he liked it or not. Are you shook up? Are you nervous? Sir, I am, sir! Do I make you nervous? Sir! Sir, what? Are you about to call me an asshole? Sir, no, sir! How tall are you, private? Sir, five foot nine, sir! Five foot nine, I didn't know they stacked shit that high. Stanley realized that it would be ideal if Lee actually could play the part. I think Lee was very, very clever. He got up, dressed up, and he did his stuff. And I believe that when Stanley saw that video, he just went, tear the script in half, we're rewriting this, put the cameras on B or me.
we were also surprised about the language because, you know, I mean, all right, I mean, Stanley's script was, was fairly realistic, but Lee came up with phrases. I will gouge out your eyeballs and skull fuck you! That were more, say, picturesque. And it looks to me like the best part of you ran down to cracking your mama's ass and ended up as a brown stain on the mattress! Astonishing, to say the least. I bet you're the kind of guy that would fuck a person in the ass and not even have the goddamn common courtesy to give him a reach around. Every time it was something else. I mean, he, he seemed to have an endless, um, yeah, endless resources on, on obscenities. I want that head so sanitary and squared away that the Virgin Mary herself would be proud to go in there and take a dump. So all of this amazing, fresh, impossible for a screenwriter to think up, dialogue was spilling out of Ermi's um, mouth, and all they had to do was record it. I don't know, but I've been told. I don't know, but I've been told. Eskimo pussy is mighty cold. Eskimo pussy is mighty cold. And he is an, a natural actor, there's no doubt about it. Something he probably didn't know. Now you listen to me, Private Pile. And you listen good. I want that weapon. And I want it now. He's what makes that film really drive at the beginning. He makes it go. Happy birthday to you. I mean, when you look at Lee's work, he really is Paris Island. He really was that DI. Happy birthday.